and so I'd like to welcome both our, as I say, um, live studio audience and our digital audience to our Greenway Chambers uh, CPD series, this uh, particular seminar focusing upon the Design Building Practitioners Act. Now, we've, we're looking at two aspects of the Act this evening. Uh, one is the regulations, which may be of varying interest uh, given the detail, but it is important in terms of the operation of the Act, its scope and its intended application. And Fahim and Declan have spent um, a great deal of time in the salt mines of the regulations, um, working through what is there and how it affects, as I say, the legislation uh, and its operation. I've been looking recently at the question of pleading, uh, obviously since the, uh, the Act came in, in particular given its retrospective operation, uh, a lot of claims have been brought forward, some in quite a hurry, uh, where parties thought they may be out of time and have lost their opportunity. Um, that has been opened up somewhat, given the 10-year retrospective operation, as I've said. However, that's ov often meant that sometimes the pleadings lack a little bit of thought, and in particular, uh, I, I've seen that some of the pleadings, if I can call it that, whether they be list statements or other, other forms of statement of claim, uh, fail to appreciate particularly the importance of the Civil Liability Act because the Civil Liability Act is specifically incorporated in Part 4 by Section 41 and it has much to say not only on the question of apportionment but also on questions of factual causation, uh, the principles associated with the application of a claim for negligence and the scope of liability. Uh, but before we come to those matters, I'd like to introduce Declan and Fahim um, they're going to arrange themselves as to uh, in what order they appear and what subjects they touch upon. And after they've dazzled you with the um, review of the regulations, we'll come back to the issues of pleading. So, Declan, for him, who's going first? Oh, you're going to come together. Even better. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. And this will be for the three of you who have come here for the regulations tonight. So, strap yourself in. Um, for the rest of you, you'll be pleased to know we won't be going through every single provision on, in the regulations. What we're just going to do is focus on what we consider to be the, um, the probably about the five key things. Uh, but, and we're going to try and sort of briefly take you through them before you all fall asleep. Now, so I think the first thing we'll talk about is the definition of building work. And some of you may have picked this up. There are... Um, there's certainly a definition of building work in the regulations and we will also talk about how that interacts with the definition of building work in the Act itself. Um, I'll, and I'll then talk about briefly the insurance obligations and also the new code of practice that's come in. And uh, my colleague Declan will then take over and talk about the paperwork obligations, how it all sort of fits in and finish by talking about the transitional provisions. Now, I think the first thing to note about the regulation is, um, section four of the regulations um, defines building work to mean work involved in, or involved in coordinating or supervising work involved in one or more of the following. So construction of a construction of a building of a class or type prescribed by the regulation, the making of alterations or addition to the buildings of that class or type, the repair, renovation, protective treatment of a building of that class or type. Now the Act also specifically provides that regulations may prescribe additional work, that's building work, and may exclude certain things. And it looks like now that the regulations have come out, the way, um, the way the people preparing the regulations have decided to go is to exclude everything except what's, class, what's known as Class 2A building. Now, the classes of buildings are defined under the um, Building Code of Australia, but essentially Class 2A building is a building that contains two or more sole occupancy units each being a separate dwelling. So that's all pretty straightforward, you might think. But there's, um, there's a few things to 
um, consider. So firstly, um, the way the definition works, it says, for the purposes of the definition of a building work, building is prescribed if a part of the building is a class 2 building. And what that essentially means is, even if the whole building's not class 2, only a part of the building is class 2, it's going to be caught up in the definition, arguably. So as a result, you could have things like mixed-use buildings, for example, which will actually be captured and the regulations will apply to those buildings. You should also note things like um, there are exclusions from the scope of the definition of building work, so things like exempt development, um, waterproofing, etc. Um, these are excluded from the definition of building work. Now, I'll now hand over briefly to my colleague Declan, who will talk a little bit about how that interacts with the definition of building work under Section 36. Okay, so um, in their wisdom, legislature has decided that there's going to be two definitions of building work in this Act. You've got one in Section 4.1, which is the definition which has now been supplemented by the regs that Fahim has just talked to you about. And we also have the pre-existing definition of building work in Section 36.1, which is important because that's the definition of building work that's relevant to determining who owes a statutory duty. Now, you'd assume that it'd be the same, but no, it's like a consumer in the Old Trade Practices Act. There's 15 different meanings in the same Act. So 36.1 defines building work um, to include residential building work within the meaning of the Home Building Act. Um, that section also defines building to have the same meaning as the in the EPA Act. You go to section 1.4 of the EPA Act, that defines a building to include part of a building and also includes any structure or part of any structure uh, that does not include manufactured home, movable dwelling, or an associated structure within the meaning of the Local Government Act. So what does that mean? Uh, you've got two definitions. The one that the statutory duty applies to is obviously on its face broader. There's no restriction to class two buildings. Also, um, because it's defined by including residential building work, there's no express exclusion of commercial buildings. Um, obviously, ex commercial buildings aren't expressly stated there either, so no doubt we're gonna see lots of litigation as to whether or not you can, the statutory duty does exist for commercial buildings. Um, so that's going to be an area that, yeah, I think watch this space. That's going to be important going forward. So the next brief thing we wanted to touch on, which we think is significant, is this issue of um, insurance. So under a number of provisions under the um, the DPD Act, so we've got section 11, 14, 24 and 33, uh, all of the different prescribed categories of registered professionals. So you've got uh, registered design um, professionals, registered engineers, and so on. There is a requirement for them to have insurance. Now, significantly, although the regulations come into effect on 1 July, the requirement to have insurance does not actually come into effect until 30 June 2023. So um, there is a bit of a leeway there for those professionals to get their insurance sorted out. The next thing that we wanted to briefly touch on is the <coughs> new code of practice that has um, come in under the regulations. So the code of practice is in Schedule 4 of the regulations. And essentially it applies to, at the moment, four categories. So we've got registered design practitioners, principal design practitioners, building practitioners, and professional engineers. But for reasons that's not entirely clear, it, um, the, effectively there are some additional obligations which seem to only apply to engineers, but don't apply to other categories of professionals. And the code of practice is sort of the kinds of things that you would expect. Um, I mean, all lawyers, we sort of have obligations. It's similar sort of things. So we've got things like, you know, um, requirement to act with honesty, integrity, and professional manner, um, must carry out the relevant work in good faith, act with a level of competence, um, you know, you have obligations of confidentiality, obligation to avoid conflicts of interest, and things like that. 
So the idea behind it is these will be the <coughs> conditions of your registration and to the extent that you breach some of these conditions you might, um, as a professional, either be subject to disciplinary action or that may cause you difficulty as you come to renew your registration. So that's really what I wanted to say. I'll hand over to Declan to talk a little bit about, um, about compliance directions. Now for the really fun stuff, we've got the paperwork. Okay, so as a refresher for those who aren't familiar with the Act, um, what the regulatory part of the Act does is create a whole lot uh, of new paperwork for construction professionals to carry out. And there's some interesting terminology and I'm going to trip over it because they're very long and complicated, not easy to say. So each design practitioner is required to provide a design compliance declaration in relation to any regulated design or an amendment to that design, and that's in section nine. Now, a compliance declaration is just a document that says the design complies with the BCA um, and any other applicable standards. Um, regulation nine, so in the new regulations, that set out some further things that you need to include in a design compliance declaration, and they include whether or not uh, any building product referred to in a design if used in a way consistent with that design, will achieve BCA compliance, and presumably that's intended to pick up cladding and that sort of issue in the future. Um, whether the design involves a performance solution, and whether or not specialist advice was sought and considered in preparing the design. So that's the uh, what a design practitioner's obligations are. You then have a principal design practitioner. They have to collect the compliance declarations from the other design practitioners, then they have to issue their own principal compliance declaration. That's under section 12. So the new regulation, regulation 29, provides that a construction certificate or a complying development consent can't be issued. It's prohibited from being issued unless each design compliance declaration and each regulated design is provided to the person who issues the certificate. So you've got to give to the council to certify your design and your compliance certificates before you get your CC or the CDC. Um, so there are similar obligations on, on building practitioners, sorry. Um, in terms of building practitioners, you've got clause 16 of the regulations provides that before commencing building work, the building practitioner must provide copies of the regulated designs, the compliance declarations and a principal compliance declaration to the secretary, uh, secretary of the department, um, and although you can delegate this to your designer. Um, the other obligation that a building practitioner has is they have to provide a building compliance declaration um, and a list of their subbies and the work that each subcontractor did. That's under section 17 of the Act. And that has to be submitted to the certifier before an application for an occupation certificate is made. And that's in the new regulation 18. Um, section 8.3 of the Act provides that a building compliance declaration has to include declarations that the design complies with the building code, that the design was prepared by a registered design practitioner and that the building was built in accordance with that design, and that a principal design practitioner produced a principal compliance declaration. Um, Regulation 30 then says you can't issue an OC, so a certifier is prohibited from issuing an OC um, unless they receive the building compliance declaration. Uh, the regulations also impose various notice requirements. Uh, for instance, a building practitioner has to give 14 days notice uh, to the principal design uh, practitioner before commencing work on site, that's regulation 23, and also before making a building compliance declaration. And I think those notice provisions are going to be important, because especially uh, the ones that uh, condition precedent to OC, because no doubt anyone, any consultants who uh, have not been paid prior to OC are going to want to put in their claims as soon as they get that notification. Okay, the last thing we're going to deal with is the transitional provisions. So the first thing to note is that the regulations commence on 1 July this year, as it, um, except for the uh, insurance bits that Fahim's already gone over. Um, but what happens to the work that's already underway? Um, it's quite strange, but Schedule 6 to the regulations amends there's transitional provisions in the Act, which does not make sense, but the Act delegates the power to amend the transitional provisions to the regulations. So nice and confusing. Um, the new transitional provisions, as amended by the regulations, say that for regulated building work, 
So that's a third definition of building work, um, which is building work for which a regulated design is required that is authorised under a construction certificate or a CDC that has commenced but not been completed as at 1 July. Uh, if, if, you, if you're in that circumstance, then the whole bunch of obligations in the Act don't apply. So, or in the regulatory part of the Act at least, I should say. So, in particular, the regulated designs, uh, the, the provisions requiring regulated designs to be prepared, including compliance declarations, don't apply nor do the obligations uh, on a person to be registered to carry out the work, nor do the building compliance declaration obligations. So it's a big change if the work's already in train. Um, nevertheless, the building practitioner is still required to provide copies of all designs to the secretary before an application for an OC is made. And principal certifier still has the obligation not to issue an OC until those documents are received. So it's sort of a halfway um, to the new regime. Um, and there's also a similar uh, but not precisely identical regime that applies to the design work as well. So that's the, that's the highlights from what's in the regulations. It's a long, they're a long document, it's about 100 pages. There's lots of hidden tricks and traps in there. It's worth a read, particularly if you're um, advising design consultants or engineers. And with that, I think I'm going to hand over to the exciting part of the presentation, the pleading issues. I think that's the first time those words have been uttered. Thanks, Frank. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Declan and Fahim, for that uh, uh, trip through um, the regulatory provisions which have now come into force. Well, pleadings, uh, something which often troubles us, but quite frankly, I mean, it's been my experience, certainly in relatively recent times, that, I mean, I'm, when I say that, I mean the last 10, 15 years or so, that between the licence one gets at places like NCAT and the terms of the um, uh, practice note associated with technology and construction list whereby strikeout applications and pleading matters are uh, treated strictly, which I think is um, code for disdain. Um, pleading issues have really somewhat fallen by the wayside, I think, in the whole construction space. And there has been a tendency to regard a Scott schedule as a pleading. Uh, and that's particularly um, so where you have uh, warranties in respect of the performance of works but more importantly, warranties as to the quality of works one, once they're finished. Uh, where one can simply say, well, you've warranted that these works will be um, fit for purpose, um, in accordance with the BCA, perform to these particular requirements, and they don't ergo liability. And that sort of pleading, if it, if it even could be called that, has become very common. And it's permissible. You can see it, you can identify it, it's there. The problem that seems to have arisen, particularly, uh, well, having this Act come in and reintroduce a common law duty, which really the High Court almost killed off entirely by the decision in Multiplex about six years ago, is that people have been approaching that obligation, that uh, potential breach and that entitlement to damages in the same way as if it were a warranty, and it's not. And what I want to talk about today is how it differs from those warranties which apply to works and what the works look like or how they perform once finished and what one can say about that when making a claim for damages and compare that to what one needs to identify particularly in the context of causation where one wishes to make a claim pursuant to this statutory duty. Now, Section 37 of the uh, Design Building Practitioners Act introduces this statutory duty of care. And now we addressed the common law developments in this area in the consolidated paper that was prepared for the CPD, which is the large document, uh, which bears uh, all of our names, including someone who's not here, Ian Roberts, who claims to be appearing somewhere at... 10 to 6 on a Tuesday, if you can believe that, appearing before a bar, no doubt. Um, but um, I didn't say before whom. Um, but in any event, when he gets up here, you can tell him that I've disparaged him and defamed him, and that's all fine. In our bigger paper, we've addressed the common law developments, particularly going back to the High Court decisions, Brian and Maloney, Woolcock, and Brookfield Multiplex, known as Corporation 61244, those touchstones whereby the uh, tide really went out on the question of common law duty. 
And the response, as we know, from the Parliament in New South Wales, having regard to um, quite infamous occasions, um, mascot towers, opal towers, all these sorts of things, was to introduce a suite of um, statutory provisions, including this one, Section 37. And Section 37 obviously specifies that a person who carries out construction work has a duty to exercise reasonable care to avoid economic loss caused by defects in or related to a building for which the work is done and arising from the construction work. Passing over Section 2 for the moment, Section 3 specifically says that a person to whom the duty is owed is entitled to damages for breach of the duty as if the duty were a duty established by common law. So we're being taken back to the common law position, which requires us to establish the facts, the nature of the duty, what its content is, what its substance is, and what is a matter of material facts one did and was not supposed to do, or did not do and was supposed to do, and how that directly led, in a causal sense, to the existence of a defect. Uh, a bit of a spoiler alert, you can't just say you decided you had to do it with reasonable care, here's a book full of defects, that proves you didn't. It doesn't work like that. You have to relate the specific obligation and the failure to meet it by act or omission with the existence of a defect as it stands. Now that might be fairly broadly able to be done when you're dealing with a builder who has a suite of obligations in respect of the whole of the works. It may be more easily done where you have a design consultant who has a specific job to produce a structural design. And if you can show that that structural design was inadequate, the works were performed in accordance with it, and there, then you've got problems in foundations or cracking or even worse, um, then that's something that may be relatively easily articulated. Where it gets more difficult is when you start dealing with people in other parts of the construction process. And we looked at the term construction work under section 36 and building work, building work sorry. Uh, well, construction work is also defined under thir section 36 to include building work, thanks for that, um, the preparation of regulated designs and other designs for building work, the manufacture or supply of should have done that earlier. The manufacture or supply of a building product used for building work. And this is one that's going to, I think, cause a lot of consideration and, and concern. Supervising, coordinating, project managing, or otherwise having substantive control over the carrying out of any work referred to above. Now, when you get beyond the usual suspects of builders and design consultants, that category, that category starts to bring in people such as certifiers, project managers, architects whose job it is to direct what is going on. Those of us who are old enough might recall Clark of Works, probably a completely foreign term, you don't remember. Um, but there used to be something called a Clark of Works that would be on site dealing with what is going on. Um, even a developer who perhaps not directly, but with a specific interest, usually driven by financial consideration, who really gets in there and starts coordinating, supervising, directing traffic, all those sort of things, can have that responsibility. And indeed, as the, the, um, the definition earlier dealt with, it doesn't need to be um, as something that is carried out under a contract or other arrangement. It can just be something which happens. So the nosy developer who wants to, um, without necessarily having the contractual power, um, effectively run the job, may very well be inviting upon themselves uh, an obligation, uh, or indeed have an obligation pursuant to this suite of uh, statutory provisions, and attract a claim for damages. Uh, we looked at the definition of building work earlier, and as um, Declan said, there does seem to be something of a disconnect between building work for the purposes of the Act and building work for the purposes of Part 4. Uh, there is that old, uh, that old saw as far as the law is concerned that the specific always applies over the general. 
So where you have a particular definition relating to this part, it may be arguable that it is broader and encompasses things like, as um, Declan said, commercial, even industrial uh, projects, such that um, uh, this duty of applies and can be utilised. Um, and as a result, I think at this stage, we should all proceed until someone tells us otherwise, um, that the statutory duty of care may apply to a wide range of contractors, design consultants and service providers in the building and construction industry. These are the other provisions. I'll just pass over them quickly. You're probably familiar with them. Section 38 uh, deals with the issue of economic loss, um, section 39 provides that the statutory duty of care is non-delegable, and that's interesting because, as we'll see, under the Civil Liability Act, it also has something to say about liability in respect of a non-delegable duty. I won't dwell on it, but I'll give you a reference to the relevant statutory provision because it may become important when you're thinking about that. Uh, section 40 provides that you can't contract out, so that's going to catch your limitation of liability clauses or those clauses that try to exclude consequential loss. You may not still be entitled to get consequential loss, of course, but you can't contract out of that provision and exclude it as a potential liability as economic loss um, in the context of this Act. And indeed, to go back to an earlier provision, Section 38, the economic loss includes reasonable costs of providing alternative accommodation just to, as an aside, there is authority from Justice McDougall in a case called Scripture Union, which says that's consequential loss and you can't recover it pursuant to the usual principles under Belgrave and Eldridge. You can get it if it's actually been incurred, but you can't get it as a reasonable cost of actually doing the work. So just something to bear in mind. Section 41. These provisions are in addition to any other obligations imposed by any other legislation, including the Home Building Act and the Common Law. They do not limit damages and, for the purposes of this discussion importantly, are subject to the Civil Liability Act. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the Civil Liability Act. Section 5, capital B, subsection 1. I don't know... How many of us are familiar with those? But these are the general principles which apply with respect to establishing negligence. These are the issues. Was the risk foreseeable? That's something you'll need to consider as part of your pleading. Was the risk not insignificant? Which, if you exclude the double negative, means significant. So the risk of defects is probably significant, but again, it depends on... Um, who you are in the, in the chain or who you are in the, in the construction process. The risk of a builder not employing a, a site foreman to supervise the work of a gang of apprentices, well, the risk that there's going to be defects in that circumstance is probably pretty high. But if you are a developer with responsibility for the performance of the works and you exercise due diligence to employ a competent contractor, you do their licence checks, you do the backgrounds and you employ them, they don't do a particularly good job, it's harder and harder to see how one could be negligent, that you hadn't actually attended to the risk of employing a competent builder by undertaking the exercise of finding an alternative and competent builder. And C, in the circumstances, whether a reasonable person in that person's position would have taken those precautions. Would the builder have allowed the gang of apprentices to run riot on the building site unsupervised? Would the developer have taken the steps to find a competent builder, licensed, good references, and employ them to do that job? I think you, you can all see where that is going. And they're the sort of things that one we need to consider when we're pleading a breach of the duty. Again, away from this idea of Book of defects equals breach of duty. What we need to establish in terms of a breach of duty is the content of that duty in terms of what someone had to do. Section 5B2. This is what the court considers when determining whether a reasonable person would have taken precautions 
against the risk of harm. Now, these all inform the common law obligations. So uh, overlying or interplaying with this, I should say, is things like Section 37. So it may, be, may very well be possible to skip over some of these things to point out the fact that there does exist a duty by reference to Section 37 because it says so. But still, it's worthwhile considering when you're dealing with a particular claim that one may wish to have, particularly when you get a notice having filed proceedings against the builder that says, here are 68 concurrent wrongdoers I think you should also sue. And these are all my subcontractors, the sub-subcontractors, the people that supplied the materials, and they just give you a list of everyone that had any involvement in the job. Now, of course, they're not supposed to do that, but the risk of it is immediately presented that if you don't do all these investigations and consider where you're at, then, as a plaintiff at least, you may find you come up short, either in part or in whole, in terms of claims being made. But these are the sort of things, when you get that list of 68 participants, large and small, in the whole process, everyone from the council who approved the plans in the first place through to the landscaper who finished off the garden, look at these questions. Look at these questions of the general principles associated with taking precautions against harm. The court has to consider the probability the harm would occur if care were not taken, the likely seriousness of the harm, the burden of taking those precautions, and the social utility of the activity. Now, I think we can all probably tick off D. We all like to think building has some form of social utility. Um, but looking at A, B and C, it's certainly worth considering. And it may very well be something you need to weave into the facts as you wish to articulate them to prove the breach of the duty having regard to these matters. Now, this is section 5, capital C. It obviously relates to other principles in relation to liability of negligence. I won't dwell on them, but they do talk... This is more an evidentiary point that you might need to look at. The burden of taking precautions, how the risk of harm might have been avoided, um, the fact that a subsequent taking of action is not necessarily taken, um, or doesn't itself, I should say, give rise to or affect liability, nor does it constitute an admission that what you actually did um, was more risky or, or, or should have been done in a different way. Section 5, capital D, another section dealing with general principles. <coughs> this is, I think, of great significance in terms of what we, as people who need to articulate these claims, need to bear in mind. Factual causation. The court has to determine, in respect of negligence causing particular harm, that the negligence was a necessary condition of the harm. A necessary condition. So the fact that you're involved in the process somewhere along the way, either as supplier, designer, certifier, whatever, that does not mean that your negligence, your failure to actually do something, A, you've got to identify it, but B, you have to identify that it caused, it was a necessary condition of the occurrence of the harm. B, it is appropriate for the scope of the negligent person's liability to extend to the harm so caused. Again, these are questions of degree. The designer who produces an inadequate design. Pretty simple answer, I think. The builder who fails to uh, employ competent contractors or fails to supervise the gang of apprentices that I keep defaming. Um, it's pretty easy to see how the scope of liability might extend to those persons. But what about the certifier? What about the person who occasionally goes there? What about the, the nosy developer who turns up, makes a pest of themselves, but then as they leave saying, but it's all up to you, I'll leave it to you, you know, you know what you're doing. I just want to keep tabs on these sort of things. Should the scope of the negligent person's liability extend to that harm so caused when there are so many other people involved in the process? <coughs> 
<coughs> and interestingly, subsection 4 of section 5 capital D, the court is required to consider whether or not and why responsibility for the harm should be imposed on the negligent party. So there are really two elements, whether or not and why. Now, how do you plead why? You might plead it by simply saying, well, section 37 says so. Uh, why is, is self-evident by the operation of the law in this particular regard. But you may need to give consideration to it as a matter of the facts. What all of this is driving to is that as practitioners in this field, for some time, it has become de rigueur to, as I say, produce a book of defects and say, breach of warranties, hand over to the experts, wait for the conclave joint report to be produced. As a matter of pleading, as a matter of articulating this claim, we need to start giving a lot more thought to the process and digging much deeper. And it can be very difficult because a lot of these projects are historical. We may have clients that weren't there. If you're acting for an owner's corporation, they're just going to shrug, shrug their shoulders and say, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't there. And it then requires investigations. But it is the sort of thing that we will be needing to do because uh, we need to satisfy these principles, these uh, matters specified under the Civil Liability Act to pursue a claim under the Design Building Practitioners Act. And the reason we need to do it is that Section 41, subsection 3 of that Act says that we have to, that the Civil Liability Act is incorporated. There's a few other provisions that you might want to look at in due course. I won't spend too much time on them. Section E, that's onus of proof. That basically says what we all know, plaintiff bears the onus of proof at all material times. Section 5.0, that's an important one. You may have come across this if you've got an insurance practice as well as a construction practice where you're dealing with PI insurance for architects and engineers and these sorts of people, um, where you can plead a, uh, a standard of care or a standard of service provided by um, or widely accepted in Australia by peer professional opinion, something that um, may need to be looked at. But that's more a question of it defending a claim rather than prosecuting one. And Section 5Q talks about, as I say, um, the liability as it exists based on a non-delegable duty, which we know the duty under Section 37 is. So those are the provisions relating to the uh, Civil Liability Act. Now, as I said, a claim under Section 37, which is made simply by noting that there are defects performed and identifying the role played by a builder constructor, design consultant, certifier, or anyone else is liable to be struck out. And the reason for this is that Part 4, Section 37, does not establish a regime of strict liability in respect of defects for any person involved in the construction process. It does not, for example, as the Home Building Act does, extend the liability for defects to developers. You need to prove the developer was of uh, conducting themselves in that way, that they were exercising substantive control over the process, and in doing so, acted in such a fashion which was contrary to what that duty required of them. Ignoring advice, for example. Directing works be performed despite people telling him or her, don't do it that way, it's going to fall down. If you can establish those things, then you can establish that the developer as the controlling mind and directing will of the project took control, acted negligently and caused the defects. But as I say, it's those steps that need to be articulated within your pleading rather than simply saying, you're the developer, there are defects, thank you very much, Section 18C of the Home Building Act. Uh, in, a, in a similar way, the existence of defects does not establish ipso facto a breach of the duty to exercise reasonable care and the principle or process of raise ipsa loquita is most unlikely to be engaged or be of assistance in these claims. One of the delights of dealing with a pleadings paper is the ability to 
show off one's limited Latin. So um, I can say things like ipso facto and res ipso loquitur, which is other than inter alia is about the extent of what I know. Um, <coughs> in any event, I'll develop that in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so the first issue to consider is under the Design Building Practitioners Act, the obligation is on the person who carries out construction work. So what did the relevant person do? As design consultant, builder, specialist, trade, contractor, person, supervising, etc. What was their nominated role? And what were they to do? Because carrying out construction work is the critical element for Section 37. The next thing is the relevant duty. The relevant duty is to exercise reasonable care to avoid economic loss caused by defects. So as a matter of pleading, we need to think about how was that person to act or supposed to carry out the construction work that they were to do. We have to identify the substance or content of that duty. It is not a mere form of words. We have to say, as the designer, they had to exercise reasonable care in examining the geotechnical conditions of the site, considering what was required by way of a foundation system, having regard to the loads that would be imposed on this structure, and prepare a design accordingly. They needed to have regard to the relevant Australian standards or whatever loads might be applied. That level of detail is appropriate and necessary, in my view, to establish the content of the duty, because then the next step doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> hang on, excuse me. Hit the wrong button. The next step is uh, causation. There's probably a, 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 an intermediate step there that I should have articulated, and that is to say, not only do we have to identify what the substance of the duty is, what the content of that is, uh, what they were supposed to do is, so the hypothetical reasonable design consultant or builder or specialist contractor, how would they uh, conduct themselves and dispose of those um, obligations in the context of this particular project? But to then go on and say, and this is what they actually did. This is what they did or did not do that was inconsistent with that duty, with the content of that duty as it exists to show that there'd been a breach. And then we move to the critical issue of causation. How the acts or omissions said to be a failure or a breach of the relevant duty caused the defects and the economic loss. Now, in the case of the hypothetical structural engineer who prepares a, an inadequate design, that causation, I think, could ordinarily be fairly easily demonstrated. That design, would always produce a building that was going to fall down in those geotechnical conditions having regard to those loads. Direct causal link. It gets harder and harder as you move away from those simpler examples and you start getting into things like my hypothetical nosy developer. Well, how did that person actually cause a crack? Or a floor that's not level? Or balconies that don't drain, or any of these particular items that we end up dealing with. The duty and its content, its breach and its consequence need to be specifically linked, not in an oblique or generic sense, but in a specific, direct, provable sense. And that takes you back to... <coughs> Factual causation under Section 5, capital D, and the scope of liability under Section 5, capital D, 1B. Now, I've put a couple of the cases up there because there have been some decisions relating to pleading under the Civil Liability Act, but they all go to the issue of apportionment and what the defendant is required to say in their list response or their defence when seeking to invoke those apportionment provisions of the Civil Liability Act. And it's well established by reference to these authorities 
uh, for more than 10 years now, that it is essential that a defendant to engage those provisions, take the benefit of them, has to identify another person as a concurrent wrongdoer by, uh, firstly, saying who they are, identifying them, seems self-evident, but nonetheless had to be said apparently, identifying who they are, identifying the basis of the cause of action that the plaintiff has against that concurrent wrongdoer. If it be in contract, identify the contract. If it be in tort, identify the duty, its scope and breach. Those are the words that were used in the HSD Masu financial management case. And lastly, identify the loss and damage for which the concurrent wrongdoer is alleged to be also liable by reference to matters of causation. Now, for my part at least, I can't see any reason why those principles of pleading set out in those cases applicable to the Civil Liability Act vis-a-vis -vis concurrent wrongdoers will not be invoked and applied for the purposes of Section 37 of the Design Building Practitioners Act. So I would recommend reviewing those cases as well, confirming they say what I've said they say. I hope they do. Um, if they don't, can someone tell me? Um, and looking at that when, when, try, when articulating the claim for the duty and the breach of duty. I won't dwell on the issue of ipso facto. We've, I've dealt with it in the, the shorter paper that appears with the material, but it's basically just me saying in a different sexy Latin way, you don't just produce a book of defects and say there's a breach of duty. You have to deal particularly with what the person was supposed to do, what they did or didn't do, how that uh, then caused the defects or these particular defects. And the more those that are pleading these sorts of claims stray away from that and simply, as I say, have a schedule and say it all relates to your negligence, um, well, you run the risk of strike out. Um, indeed, the reason this paper has been has come up is that I recently had um, one of these arguments before Justice Stevenson of the Supreme Court. Now, he hasn't delivered a decision, mainly because the plaintiff saw the writing on the wall and said, uh, I won't press for my amendments, and I won't, because they were wanting to amend to include other claims, but that's not important. Give me another chance, I'll go away and make it better. And Justice Stevenson, being the good bloke that he is, said, all right, you've got till the end of June. Um, so we wait to see whether or not that plaintiff is actually going to try. And there have been indications they just might give up, but because um, it all seemed a bit hard for them, quite frankly. Um, because they had approached it in that way. They'd given us a huge schedule and said, well, yeah, there's a reasonable duty. You're this, you're that. You know, you're all negligent. We'd like a stack of money, please. And... Um, uh, we said no. So even though, as I was talking to you earlier, there is the practice note, there is the dissuasion given to us, in that list at least, from having pleading fights. Um, and thankfully, I don't know what it's like in NCAC because I haven't been there for ages, but I think they don't even have them at all down there. You just have to... Points of, you have points of claim and defence. Do you get them struck out, though? Uh, really? <laughs> <Not, laughs> do they, do they have any power or... Not, not a tribunal. Or, strict or, pleading is yeah. the line you get back. So. Right. Well, you may be facing some of these things down there, but certainly, um, well, list statements, which you know, are creatures of the practice note themselves, or obviously district court pleadings, those sorts of places, you will need to address these things. Now, I just wanted to talk quickly about um, three words that sort of trip off the tongue in the context of negligence and these sorts of common law claims in the past, and that's raise ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. You often get where people don't really know what the negligence is or they can't point to a, an actual negligence act. They just go, oh, raise it to lock water. It's all very obvious and all these kind of things. Um, and, you know, there's clearly defects, etc., etc. The, the leading case on this principle, or indeed it's actually more of a process of reasoning, is called um, Schellenberg and Tunnel Holdings. There it is. And it cited the decision in Mummery Irving's Proprietary Limited. Now, 
this principle or process arises in circumstances where an event happens which is completely um, outside the ordinary course of things or simply doesn't happen in the ordinary course of things where those who um, are engaged to manage these things exercise reasonable care. Now, it all, well, not all, but it, it, it springs in, in some measure from a decision in England where um, a barrel careered out of a factory, out a window and hit someone in the head. Now, um, they were saying, well, we don't know why this barrel came careering out the window and hit me in the head, but clearly, if they've been running things properly in the factory, barrels don't go careering out of windows and hit people in the head. And the court agreed. They said, that's just not the sort of thing that happens where there is proper and good management. Now, a lot of people might think, well, that's just a licence to say, well, this doesn't ordinarily happen. Defects don't ordinarily happen if people exercise due and proper care. Laughable as though that proposition might seem to those of us who practice in this area regularly, but it may very well give an opportunity to circumvent the usual processes of pleading and proof associated with common law duties and breach thereof. Now, the High Court decision in Schellenberg and Tunnel Holdings, referring to what was said in Mummery and Irving's, reaffirmed this and said that in order to pursue a line of reasoning or inference of res ipsa loquitur, it's important to establish that the immediate or proximate cause of the occurrence is simply unexplainable or not available in the ordinary course of things. And the, I think the example in the decision of Mummery and Irving's actually, if I keep, stop, is actually instructive. Now what happened in Mummery and Irving's is that someone entered the defendant's premises and got hit in the head with a block of wood. It's not funny, I don't know why people are laughing, but anyway, it's kind of funny, but um, well it was 56, so I think time's passed long enough, we're going to have a bit of a giggle. Um, got hit in the head with a block of wood. Now, in that decision, the court said, well, if the evidence had established no more, that one could know no more, that upon entering the defendant's premises, the plaintiff had been violently struck by a piece of wood flying through the air, then res ipsa loquitur may apply. But in that case, they were able to more precisely identify the events. And the evidence established that the wood had been thrown by a circular saw that was operating within the premises. So the narrower question was, was the circular saw being operated negligently? How had it failed? How had it caused the block of wood to go flying in the air and strike this unfortunate person as it did? Because there was a more precise question to be assessed, because there was a more precise issue to be determined on the question of negligence, raise it to lock what it doesn't apply. You don't get the benefit of that general idea of barrels coming out of windows or people getting hit in the head with blocks of wood, where, as a matter of the evidence, you know, well, actually, there was a more direct, specific, proximate cause of the event or the accident or the incident that you wish to claim for. Now, in my view, having regard to that line of thinking and reasoning and authority, it's unlikely that you're going to have a circumstance where res ipsa loquitur is going to apply to a defects claim. Because you're never going to have that situation where it would be unknowable or reasonably unknowable or one couldn't possibly investigate how a defect exists and it just would not have happened in the ordinary course of things. The activities that you're dealing with, you're always going to be able to find out at some level. Was it design? Was it construction? Was it a combination of both? How did that uh, go wrong, if I can use it in that general sense, in the circumstances? So if someone presents you with one of these claims and tries to enchant you with the magic formula raise ipsa loquitur, you can tell them Schellenberg can't do that. In conclusion, I invite the, 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 you to review the papers and by all means, if anyone has any queries, whether those of, those of us who are here or those of us who are with us digitally, um, I would invite you to just send us emails, 
well, I'd invite you to send Declan emails and then he, he'll decide whether or not <laughs> he can forward them to me. And, well, you're going to answer them, isn't no. um, So uh, we'll work that out. I keep turning that off. I should, oh, no. Hang on. Where did my conclusion go? Ah, there we are. So the conclusion. A claim for a breach of statutory duty may be available against various persons in the construction process. The pleaded claim must state with proper particulars the source of the duty, how or why in the circumstances of the case was this duty assumed or imposed on this particular person, anyone from design consultant all the way through to the person who does the final landscaping, and the activities in between, the content of the duty, in a practical material and particular terms, what did the duty require of that person? What the person did or did not do, having regard to that duty, how those acts or omissions were a breach of the duty, having regard to its content, and importantly then, factual causation, how those breaches caused defects, and the more specific you can be, the better, and scope of liability, why the person should be liable for the harm caused. And that may simply be as much as referring to section 37, subsection 3, um, but it may also be good if one can consider the facts and why that liability should exist. As with all pleadings, it's relatively easy to say in the abstract, and it's much more difficult to do in the specific. What it does really require of us is better attention, better instructions, uh, and more thought to exactly how cases like this are going to be prosecuted and ultimately proved to the relevant standard. Um, that's it. I'll leave the statement of conclusion up there. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And if you have any questions, particularly about the paperwork that Declan talked about under the regulations, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them. And I'm happy to talk about pleadings as well. But um, thank you very much. Thank you.